without any further ado may i uh, now request mr sanjay seth ceo griha council and our keynote speaker dr helen lockett dean faculty of built environment unsw sydney to join us on the dais for the keynote address please and i would request all of you to please welcome them with a round of applause I now request Mr. Sanjay Seth to kindly introduce a keynote speaker and take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gagan. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you back after this lunch uh, break. Uh, we have Professor Helen Lockett. Uh, she's an Australian architect, urban and landscape designer. Prior to her appointment as dean, she held a number of influential positions in the New South Wales government and the city of Sydney. Her career has focused on the inception, planning, design, and delivery of complex multidisciplinary projects and public works. Professor Lockheed maintains a high profile in the profession and her professional contribution has been recognized through many industry awards. She has been appointed as the jury for various institutes and design competitions. So what she's going to be doing today in the keynote address is that we know that the world is changing, which requires new imperatives and an evolved style of working. Professor Helen will be providing an overview of the key sustainability themes in the work of the Pritzker Prize laureate, Professor B.V. Doshi and Professor Glenn Merkett in line with the changing times. So without further ado, Helen, I think you have a, a lot to speak, right? So, and a video to be playing. Over to you. Thank you, Sanjay. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's a privilege to be here in Delhi, and we're also extremely happy and uh, privileged to be partnering with you on this 10th Griha Summit. As part of the program, we agreed a great way to start the summit was to hear from global leaders in their fields. The Pritzker Prize is architecture's highest accolade globally. Is that, can, can you hear? The Pritzker Prize is architecture's highest accolade globally, so it was fitting that we invite two, our two most eminent architects and Pritzker laureates, Balkrishna Doshi from India and Australia's Glenn Merkert, to share their wisdom and insights, as designing sustainably is intrinsic to their practice. I visited each in their studios, Professor Doshi in Ahmedabad and Professor Merkert in Sydney to learn more about their work. We will hear about what they had to say shortly in a brief video we made to show you today. It provides but a glimpse into the minds and practice of these great architects. And if you're interested, the full interviews will be available on the UNSW website shortly. They're worth watching, I have to say. But more of that later. There were some key themes and takeaways from my conversations with both of them that I'd like to share with you. While Doshi and Merkut's buildings are distinctly different in their architectural expression, being tailored to their regional contexts, there are many common themes in their work. A respect for the environment and our resources, a responsiveness to climate and culture, a preference for passive systems and simple technologies, and an understanding of place that makes for more sustainable and enduring places that are also eminently livable and memorable. This ethos that they both share is built on deep powers of observation of the physical world around them and the places they inhabit. Both cite the influences of their formative years, the places they grow up, as being pivotal to their design ethos. The influences of early modernist architects are clearly evident, but not the prime driver of their architectural idioms. For Merkert, his work is strongly grounded in the larger landscape and the climate in which he works in Australia. 
His sensitivity to the terrain, the ecology and the weather patterns result in buildings that can be adjusted and tuned like a sailboat to the times of day or seasons of the year to suit the occupants' needs. In turn, they are minimal and efficient in terms of energy and materials, requiring no more than necessary. Doshi's projects do this and more. They have a broader remit. They go beyond functional climatic and environmental considerations and respond to the unique social and cultural conditions of India. Drawing on his own experiences of Indian family life, of close-knit communities of limited means, he has consciously designed places that utilize local materials, skills, and traditions to empower people to adapt and change their places as their needs and means evolve. For Doshi, fostering economic well-being and social inclusion are core to the delivery of more sustainable communities. The principles of sustainable development are demonstrated in all that they do. Furthermore, their deep sense of environmental responsibility is imbued with a human-centric approach to architecture and placemaking. They preface human well-being, comfort, and quality of life. This, this gives their projects a warmth, generosity, and livability that provide valuable lessons for us all. Can we translate the lessons from these seemingly simple yet compelling paradigms into our increasingly complex world? Well, today we're facing new and emerging challenges, and these have already been touched on by others. We live in a world where the, place, the pace and scale of development is accelerating and the impact's growing. 50% of the world's population live in cities, and with 2 million people moving to cities every week, by 2050, it will be 70%. And the demand for safe and affordable housing is facing unprecedented demand, especially in places like India. But it is a global phenomenon. Cities consume more than two thirds of our global energy and the built environment is a major contributor to carbon emissions. We know the consequent impacts and cost to the environment, human settlements and well-being are unsustainable. And so we have an enormous task ahead. Climate projections point to higher temperatures and extreme weather events becoming increasingly common. And under these conditions, we know the most vulnerable are most impacted, the poor, the aged, and the infirm. Many burgeoning cities in both our countries and elsewhere are facing growing inequality along with unsustainable environmental demand. The socioeconomic divide is escalating between the haves and the have-nots. And this plays out in cities globally, where we see a distinct spatial divide between places of opportunity and ghettos of disadvantage, characterized by lower incomes, poor access to jobs and services. With uneven investment come other impacts, poor air quality, urban heat, and chronic health conditions such as obesity, diabetes, and asthma, to name a few. Interestingly, I was in Ahmedabad a couple of days ago and there was a study recently completed by SEPT planning students which directly parallels our own research in our city of Sydney where the spatial divide in the, in the city is pretty much clear on geographical lines in how these places of opportunity and value are distinct and separate. It could have been written about Sydney. I, I was so amazed. If cities are to continue to be con economic engines that underpin national economies, new development needs to be sustainable and change a place for the better over the long term. We must embrace the social, ecological and economic imperatives and ensure that our cities and towns are more environmentally and socially responsive to the fundamental needs of all people through improved housing and services and urban habitats that are cleaner, greener and healthier. This demands substantial shifts in the planning, design, development, and management of our cities, plus new ways of working, way beyond the remit of our eminent Pritzker laureate's practice. Because of the pace, scale, and diffuse nature of urban expansion this century, conventional models of city making reliant on top-down planning and project implementation are less viable when dealing with such dynamic conditions. 
There is a need to focus on the complex challenges of our cities at every scale and from different standpoints. This is core to our faculty's agenda at UNSW Built Environment. We do this by fostering collaborative interdisciplinary research and education. Our mission is to shape future cities that are resilient, healthy and smart. Cities that are connected, green, livable and more importantly, inclusive. We explore these urban imperatives through multiple lenses, including the design and construction of energy efficient buildings that are able to meet our future demands and a human centered design ethos responsive to the needs of all people in our society, society and cultural landscape. From industrial design products and services to innovation in design and fabrication to urban policy and planning at the city and territorial scales, we interrogate environmental challenges such as urban heat and urban health through to socio-economic inequity in our cities. For the next generation to rise to these urban challenges and to expand the relevance in terms of engagement of the built environment professions, we are shaping a different educational paradigm a paradigm shift that challenges, challenges our current pedagogy. While we will continue to value deep disciplinary expertise, our educational model is, will be broader and nimbler to prepare graduates for the global drivers and nature of practice in the 21st century. A model that values ideas, critical inquiry and speculation and encourages collaboration and a transdisciplinary mindset. A model that enables adaptive and innovative processes to inform new modes of practice in our unpredictable world of both formal and informal settlements. Interdisciplinary learning is fundamental to our pedagogy. All students across all built environment disciplines, whether from planning or architecture, landscape architecture through to industrial or computational design, construction, project management and development, participate in interdisciplinary programs to introduce collaborative problem solving. They do this through university-wide challenges around open-ended questions and engagement with industry and communities on real-world problems. This cross-cutting collaboration is seen as pivotal to their education. For graduates to be creative, critical, entrepreneurial and strategic, we provide a platform that fosters nascent practice models and ways of working, and such exploration demands evidence-based research as a precursor, but also new strategies to navigate and interpret the plethora of data that surrounds us. This is where the combination of lateral and analytical thinking with technical and technological proficiency are essential and gives the design professionals a head start. From harvesting big data to understand patterns of movements in cities to, imply, to applying new digital technologies to design responsive and interactive spaces, we believe our graduates will be differentiated in our globally mobile work environment. Today's students are hungry for meaning and agency, engaging in real world projects and with communities to address environmental and socio-political issues of consequence provides a roadmap for future practice where they can see a clear nexus between their educational endeavors and the potential of their work to improve the lives and livelihoods of people beyond their project. At UNSW, this is explored through social engagement at the local level and globally through multi-year international studios, competitions and collaborative research projects with communities, practice and industry. We anticipate that this, with this foundation, our graduates will acknowledge their social contract and shape our future cities to be more inclusive, resilient and eco-friendly. Beyond our educational platform, UNSW academics are tackling complex urban challenges through their high impact research critical policy and design issues that have the potential to improve the built environment and in turn improve people's lives are research priorities. This vital research is concentrated around a number of research collaborations including the City Futures Research Center, the Cooperative Research Center for Low Carbon Living, the Livability Lab and City Analytics Labs all showcased here at Griha over the next few days. 
The City Futures Research Centre is a national leader in scholarly applied urban research and supports four major urban research programs in urban housing, urban policy and development, urban analytics and health and well-being, such as the data analysis and mapping that mapped the social inequity in Sydney that I talked about earlier. The Cooperative Research Centre for Low Carbon Living is a multi-sector end-user driven re research partnership to address the global challenges of climate change by lowering carbon emissions in the built in environment. One of the research centre's major initiatives are living labs that range from individual buildings to entire precincts. They monitor, evaluate and iterate in situ research in real time, providing continuous learning feedback loops. And in fact, we've got a, a living lab right here at Greehart over the next few days monitoring the area in which we're, we're occupying. You can see the outcomes of that research over in the exhibition. But examples of, of CRC's work include low carbon housing and complete streets being prototyped to assess a suite of measures including new materials and technologies to mitigate heat and improve human comfort in the urban environment. So within this context, we are actually optimistic that a UNSW built environment, we're building an agile platform for research and exchange that can respond to the changing needs of the professions. By developing skilled graduates and researchers who can positively engage, adapt and shape our future built environment for the benefit of all people and the planet firmly in mind. It is a very great honour for UNSW to, to contribute to the 2018 Griha Summit and showcase our research expertise and innovations in India. To learn from one another and to strengthen existing relationships and forge new ones. This forum will explore how together we can all contribute to shaping more sustainable, livable and inclusive places and cities that value our cultures now into the future. If our Pritzker laureates were starting on their professional journeys now, how different would it be? But for now, let's hear what our Pritzker laureates had to say about their professional journeys. Thank you. Professor Doshi is one of India's most eminent architects. He has been instrumental in shaping the discourse of architecture throughout India and internationally. He has numerous prestigious awards to his name, including the 1993 Aga Khan Award and the 2018 Pritzker Prize, architecture's highest accolade. In the Pritzker citation, the jury noted his solutions take into account the social, environmental and economic dimensions, and therefore his architecture is totally engaged with sustainability. Using patios, courtyards and covered walkways as in the case of the SEPT School of Architecture in Ahmedabad or the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, Doshi has created spaces to protect from the sun, catch the breezes and provide comfort and enjoyment in and around his buildings. He developed contemporary, regionally specific habitats that united modern techniques of fabrication with local crafts and traditions. Moreover, he has a deep sense of responsibility and a desire to contribute to his country and its people through high quality, authentic and sustainable architecture. Hello, Professor Doshi. Thank you so much for joining us here today and thank you for agreeing to do this interview. No, I'm so glad and thrilled enough that you have come. Now, Professor Doshi, you have a long and illustrious career with over 100 projects, over 60 years in practice. But tell me, how did you come to be an architect? What were your key influences that led you to a, such a regionally specific form of expression in your work? My journey has been uh, several accidents choices and opportunities. I was a student of art and my teacher mentioned to me, why don't you go not for engineering or science, but join architecture. That's how I went into architecture in Bombay. Most important and memorable experience was my grandfather and his family. Because in that grand family, in Indian 
grand family is an extended family. And that extension can expand, you know, into the street where all the relatives would stay next to one another. So for me, my memories are connected to people, relations, communities, lifestyles, rituals, because in that age, some people are 80 and some people are just newly born. So there is a cyclic order that I experience. And same way about the house which grew. So you add a staircase and you add a floor. Your architecture or your building is quite unique because it does actually draw on contemporary materials yes. as well as traditional materials. That's right. It uses uh, different devices such as screens and shading. Yes which is a in modern interpretation of traditional ways of shading and providing ventilation and, and locking out the bright sun. So um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the way you actually have mediated the climate in your buildings and use some examples. So when I started the school in 1962, it was that kind of issue that we will not talk about architecture as capital A, but we would talk about architecture, a way of life, way of understanding, and it includes multiple disciplines. That is how SEP came. So the school was called Center for Environmental Planning and Technology. So can you tell us something about how, when you designed SEPT, these principles were manifest in the place that, that you created there? For example, when the clients, my clients were my uh, patrons, also, when I selected the site, they were wondering why I have selected a ruined brick kiln. And I said, I want that brick kiln to be changed and used. So today it is transformed into rolling grounds and green grass and water harvesting. So all the things I did. Second was, when a student comes to a school or visitor comes to the school, what is it that he likes? You know, in the scorching sun, he looks for shade. In a dry place like this, when there are hardly any trees, you want to see some green. Then as you move, other thing that I do in my architecture is the process of entering architecture, the movement, and the kind of interaction that happen into changing situations. So because the levels were different, I tried to use those levels. And you come far away, it's like a journey. It's like a story. So connections to me are very important with nature. So even though the space is enclosed, it should be open. Second is choices. A third one is discovery. The fourth one is communicating with the world outside and inside. All these things happen. Can you tell us more about how you came into housing? So I was trying to see how do you create social change? How do you create something that somebody, a client wants it, but I would like to see how disparities, disjunctions, for example, a child of the pune and child of the boss, can they, can they cross the road? Can they play game together? In, in Indian conditions, you have to constantly find ways and means to create confluence of attitudes so that your learning, your living becomes much better and the ages disappear. And I thought that given a chance, they, everybody would eventually expand and grow. And this will be an incentive for them, the ownership, so that they would have the future. Their children will think about the future. And I think this is what changed my way. So we did the houses and then we made demonstration houses with Harghadko. 60 houses we built, model, a ground floor, then a ground end first, then a ground end second. And we showed them how their cooperative can learn about creating jallies, employment, then social welfare, then understanding this. Second change, the biggest change was I did not put them together as one category, lower category here, a middle category here, upper category here. I had made them in such a way that they are in the center. The periphery was slightly bigger plots. So when you sell them, you get more money and subsidize them. So it is like reversing the order. You remove the ghetto, 
but you bring the ghetto within your family. It's like children, you know, you bring and you make them grow. And that is the example, and I think that is one of the most satisfying things that I did. What you've demonstrated over the time we've been talking is how you create enduring places that people love. It's about creating places which are yes. not only sustainable, but livable yes. and memorable. Yes, and sir. that is imbuing the culture of the place in which you work, but also understanding the regional differences and the particularities which you need to respond to in your work. How do you do that in a rapidly changing world? So I think the whole question is, what is it that we want to do? For what purpose we want to do? And how does it affect human being, time, energy, relationship, and ability to grow? I have not done something new. I have only done what I found in the villages and other places, and I just made that aranya. Empower people and do it in within proper proportions. Professor Doshi, it's so obvious that what you're talking about is a holistic, integrated approach to living and, and livability, which is really about not only how you live, but where you live and what you need to live with, which is totally about sustainability. And I think it's, it's absolutely an exemplar in the way you've demonstrated that through your work that we have seen today. And I thank you very much for your time. No, I tried. Thank you so much for coming here and uh, talking to me about these things which I love so much. What I would just say is that the scale of work that we do, the kind of work we do, if we can look at the kind of lifestyles and people around which we have, the kind of uh, heterogeneous society or in inequality of society, if we can find approaches suitable to them, we will have better society and better places to live and better cohesion and more peace and prosperity. I totally agree with you. Thank you. A good note to end on. Thank, Thank you. you. Glenn Merkert is a modernist, a naturalist, an environmentalist, a humanist and ecologist, encompassing all of these distinguished qualities in his practice. His is an architecture of place, architecture that responds to the landscape and to the climate. He uses light, water, wind and the sun in working out the details of how a house will work, how it will respond to its environment. He works from a home office in Sydney and still works by hand, using computers only sparingly. And yet he still maintains a waiting list of clients who are keen to work with him. His work continues to be innovative and evolving. Thank you for joining us, Glenn. And it's a pleasure to be here and join you in your home office today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions, but before we begin properly, I'd really like to understand some of the, the key influences. You have a very um, regionally specific form of expression and architecture, which ha is a, really a direct and visceral response to the landscape and the climate in which mm. you're working. Mm. So what brought you to that way of working? Mm. Well. I grew up in my first years in Papua New Guinea and we lived in a region which was the lower end of the highlands on the upper Watat River. And so one took into account that whole question of security and insecurity in oneself, both physical and psychological. And observation became a, a very survival instinct. So observation of the landscape became part of that wonderful area of thinking. And that is to understand why things are so. Your work has been described and you've described your work uh, as touching the earth lightly. Can you explain more what you mean by touching the earth lightly? Now, to touch the earth lightly, first of all, it's, you must have respect for that land. To have respect for the land you don't mutilate it. You use it wisely, and the products you use, one is very careful about using them. For example, if one uses um, uh, timber, which is a renewable resource, so long as it is renewable and it's not consumed at a rate greater 
than its growth rate, then it takes five megajoules per kilogram to have it in its final state as a piece of furniture. If we look at steel, it's about 35 megajoules per kilogram. And if we look at aluminium, it's 143 megajoules per, kil per kilogram. And we know each of these products in gaining them can destroy the planet in different ways. So one must use them wisely. I'm going to be using these products, but I'm very aware that one must minimise that high consumption of energy product. So in, if you're going to use aluminium, you use it in the smallest sections for the most appropriate requirements. And timber, you can use much more. So touching the earth lightly is about understanding products we use and their, their, the basis of consumption. But it's also what we do with the buildings, how we place our buildings on a site, how we don't, we don't place it into the ground where it's going to change the water table. And that water table is going to change the flora each side and down below the building. To actually avoid air conditioning, design a building in a way that doesn't consume energy to, for cooling. These are, the, some of, these are some of the things. To use glass appropriately, to use roof overhangs, so that in summertime you've got beautiful shade in different parts of our climatic uh, uh, nation. The thing is this, that if you orient, orient the buildings correctly, you see the winter sun angle is 31 degrees 33 minutes. And you can get that in a room that is four and a half metres deep, going the whole whole width of the room so the whole floor is is bathed in sunlight now that is not only warming that air space spatially but it's psychologically warming as well if we take the boyd center that wendy lewin reg lark and i did in equal collaboration it is a building for 32 children between the ages of about 10 up to age about 17 to 18 to come and as Arthur Boyd wanted and Yvonne Boyd wanted to use the building but not use up the environment and to be able to become aware of nature. And so on that site, the location is very important in its siting. On one side is the native landscape. On the other side, is the cultivated landscape. Is the planning strategy as simple as I can take it? Not simplistically, but as simple. Remember, simplicity is the other face of complexity. Like a very good stock, we take all that leftovers and we put them into water and we cook them for an hour or two hours and it comes down to a cupful embodied in that is incredible complexity but it's very simple i love that simplicity what would be your sort of takeaway in terms of where to from here mm. how do we actually address this time and maintain and ensure we maintain a more sustainable and livable planet mm. Mm. Because the planet is so being abused, I don't have to join that and I won't join it. The greatest achievement I have in my lifetime is that I've survived doing what I want to do. Um, that has been amazing that I've decided I know what I want to do and I don't want to join the rabble. Uh, and I want to do decent work. Since most of us are going to be doing ordinary things in our lives, the most important thing is to do those ordinary things extraordinarily well. And to do that takes time. Thinking and designing requires a gestation period. It requires time. And remember that for every compromise you knowingly make in your work, and that's not about arrogance. That is doing something less than you're capable of. So that for that compromise, the built work, when the compromise is completed, represents the quality of your next client. 
So we get the client we deserve. Well, I'm sure there's only one reason why you're a Pritzker laureate, and that's because you've maintained this absolute standard in your own work and in everything you've done. So thank you for taking the time today, Glenn. It's been a pleasure, Helen. So there you had two Pritzker Prize uh, laureates, uh, Glenn Murkert and Professor Doshi. And incidentally, he's also the chair, the chair of the jury which decides the uh, Pritzker Prize. And he's also an alumni of UNSW. So the 10th GRIA summit has kind of completed the circle, huh? getting all of these people. And then, of course, we have Helen. Glenn taught Helen, it seems. And uh, so there you are. Everyone is uh, associated. It's a big, large family partnership coming together. We are so proud that uh, you know we have been associated with UNSW in this 10th uh, summit, where Professor Doshi has been awarded the first time as the Pritzker Prize in India, and uh, all of it is happening. It's a big family, UNSW, GRIA, and so on. And thank you so much, Helen, for doing this for us. She's responsible. She came all the way to India. She went across to Doshi Saab, and he, she got her interview. She got him interviewed, and then, of course, uh, went back to Sydney and got uh, Professor Glenn Merkut's interview as well. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, Helen and for you all you know we've taking ad taken advantage of our presence here so the India Habitat Center puts together a, a lecture series which is called the science technology and innovation policy forum si lecture series and on 12th of December uh, that is tomorrow we are having her speak deliver this lecture which is a very prestigious lecture and this is going to be at the Casarina Hall in the India Habitat Center so those of you who are interested in listening to what she's going to be speaking on, I invite you all. And I think her talk is going to be on, uh, oh, it doesn't mention. So you're going to keep that a secret and maybe reveal it tomorrow? OK, I see. So she's going to be talking off towards uh, more sustainable cities. I invite you all to attend the uh, lecture series for those of, to whom it is of interest. All right, so thank you very much. With that, we. Uh, I think need to applause uh, Helen for doing this honors and over to you Gagan. Thank you sir. Uh, thank you Dr. Lockett for your uh, amazing address and the wonderful videos of with Professor Glenn Market and Bibi Doshi sir. Um, as you're aware this is the 10th edition of the Grihas flagship event. It takes a lot of support and work to put together an event of this magnitude, and the summit would not have been possible without the support and encouragement of our partners. We would like to take this opportunity to felicitate our esteemed partners. I request uh, uh, Dr. Lockett and Mr. Sanjay Se to kindly give away the mementos. I request the representatives uh, of these partners to kindly come up on stage and receive the mementos as they call out the names of the organization. Uh, let's begin with uh, AIS. And I would like to uh, ask, request you to kindly applaud uh, our partners, for please. Very well. Arba Cell. A 
anyone from National Bamboo Mission? LG India Anyone from LG India? Are you developers? Limited. Saint Gobain Savita Polymers Limited. International Tech Park. and stone. Ashwath Infratech. Unified. Ignis IT and Rupa Group. Thank you so much, Dr. Lockhead and Mr. Said. I would now request Mr. Said to present a small token of appreciation to Dr. Uh, Lockhead.
These paintings showcase Gond art, which comes with the belief that good image brings good luck. The Gond are a major tribal community of central India. The artists have used natural colors derived from charcoal, colored soil, plant sap, leaves, and cow dung. This mystical art form is created by putting together dots and lines. Thank you, sir. That essentially concludes our keynote address. May I now request everyone to proceed to the, for a short break to the hub area where tea and coffee will be served. After tea, we have four, three parallel tracks. The venue for the thematic track five um, is Juniper Hall. Thematic track six, Unwinding Circular Economy is Tamarin. And thematic track seven is Transition to Clean Energy is Jacaranda. I request you all to be presented at the respective venues as at 345 sharp for these interesting and thought-provoking sessions. Thank you.